Thank you. So, uh, so I wasn't sure how long you guys want me to talk. I can talk for hours and hours and hours. So I, I did a relatively short presentation for me with the idea being that um, uh, when I get to the end, you guys can ask me questions. I can talk more about one aspect. You guys can interrupt me with questions as I go. Um, and, and so very, uh, was trying to be very open. And, and so you guys tell me if you want to hear more about something or, or not, um, if that sounds okay. Okay, cool. Um, so let me just move this over here. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, what I was going to, what I thought I'd talk to you guys about a little bit today is just, you know, a little sense of, um, our, increasingly scary world, our increasingly da disaster rich world. Again, you guys interrupt me with any questions or if I'm not being clear, or I freeze or something. Um, and, uh, but in trying to promote some discussion, um, I wanted to first uh, preface stuff. I think sometimes when we hear these, these stories, they can be very scary and they can be very depressing and they can lead people to thinking, ah, oh, throw in the towel, game over kind of deal. And I don't think that at all. I think I think these challenges that we're facing, that you all are facing, um, are solvable. I'm not saying they're easy, but they are absolutely solvable. We created these problems. We can we can get ourselves out of these problems. But um, I've noticed. Um, I think especially in this time of COVID, when when we've had so many other challenges, there's a, a strain among some people to get. Like, oh man, another thing. Like, I'm, I'm just totally depressed and, and oh my God, and the world is over and blah, 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 blah. And, and please don't think that, um, everybody. Um, uh, and, and first and foremost, uh, this is not, I don't want you to all be a macho dude or something like that, but, but I think it's important to not be a wimp. I think when we look at these challenges, um, they are scary and, and they are um, a fear inducing and they can sometimes make us uh, want to go curl up in bed underneath a blanket or something, but, um, but don't, right? We need, all of you need to be lending your hands and your minds and your thoughts and your love, quite frankly, for our planet to get us out of this. So, um, so before I start talking about specifics, I wanted to just sort of frame um, my thinking of, of disasters and things of that nature. So does anybody know uh, when this picture here was or where it is? Any guesses? The fires? Like, yeah, the Woolsey fire. Absolutely. This is the Woolsey fire. So this is a picture from the LA County Sheriff's Department as they were in um, sort of the more southeasterly part of Malibu uh, looking up. And what you see is they've shut down PCH. So on the right-hand side, there's no cars going, going towards Ventura. All the traffic is coming back. And essentially, all the cars are locked up. And they're, they're, they're bumper to bumper, and they're having a hard time getting out. So the fire, which we normally think of the fire as not being in the coastal zone, we normally think of fire in, in the forests, in the mountains, in the grasslands. Increasingly, we're seeing fire everywhere, uh, in the west at least, including all the way down to the beach. Um, uh, again, I can tell stories about all these different fires uh, if you guys are curious, but um, the other, a couple things are happening. The world is becoming more... Um, dangerous in the sense of more disasters are happening. But also, and really importantly, the speed at which change is happening is going crazy. So if we were in Simi Valley, right, near where the Woolsey fire broke out, and we got in our car and we drove to the mount to the beach at Malibu, right? There's a freeway, we get on the, go down the 23. We could be booking down there uh, at at you know freeway speeds, let's say. Uh, and then, you know, we'd get on the 101 and, and et cetera. Um, we could be from Simi Valley, we could be at the beach in about 45 minutes or so, right? In a car going super fast. The flames, the Woolsey Fire flames went from uh, Simi Valley or near Simi Valley, Moore Park area, to the crests of Malibu and started heading down into the, into the um, uh, coastal zone in about an hour. So those flames were moving about as fast as you could drive. And so, so the, this whole new series of fires, it can be quite scary. It can be quite uh, fear-inducing. And so, uh, let's see if I can, 
fix this. There we go. Okay. So I want to talk real briefly about so my background, when I was, so you guys are all young, you guys are in, in, in at Oaks and, and uh, learning about stuff. When I was a little bit younger than you all were, or maybe some of your guys' age, when I was 13, this came on television. And this was a huge thing. You guys probably never heard of this. It was called The Day After. And incredibly uh, powerful thing. This was a, a television movie put on by ABC. Um, is, has anybody ever heard of this film, out of curiosity? No. Yeah. Okay. So it's, 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 it'd be an interesting watch for you guys to go back and, and rewatch it. Basically this started in the late seventies with some, some TV folks wanting to do some more um, realistic uh, dramas and stuff. And they, they hit on this notion of nuclear war. Um, hard for you guys maybe to understand how desperate the times were um, uh, before the, 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 ending of the Cold War. So the Soviets were poised to destroy us with a gazillion million nuclear bombs. We were po poised to destroy them with a gazillion million nuclear bombs. And no one seemed to have an answer. This television show came on in November 1983. I was 13 years old. Um, and it was crazy. It was There was nothing like it before. Um, so disturbing was it that the, the, the television st uh, uh, presentation started with a warning. And, uh, you know, psychological harm. If you have children, you might not want them to watch this. If you have kids and they are going to watch it, you should talk to them beforehand because it, it essentially portrayed the realities uh, or as much as we could in a television movie in the early 80s, the realities of the wake of a nuclear war. So this wasn't, there's a bomb going off here and there's an opening scene that, that won some um, Emmy Award for the best special effects. So the bombs went off. But really what this was about, middle America, um, a town in middle America and uh, in, and the wake of what would happen after nuclear war. It was super depressing, super scary. It wasn't big macho Rambo kind of stuff. It was, what is it going to do to society? At the end of that show, so disturbing was it that a national call-in program was launched so that people could um, talk about how depressed they were and stuff. And so this this show that I watched as a 13-year-old gave me nightmares. I don't really have nightmares. This show gave me nightmares for years. Um, and so uh, in this in this the show viewpoint that came on after this 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 television show about nuclear war, or the or the aftermath of nuclear war, there were all these experts and they were talking. And one of those experts was Carl Sagan, who was a public scientist, a uh, public intellectual. And he said this quote that's become quite famous. He said in describing the U.S.-Soviet um, um, stalemate and, and, and fight over this apparently impossible situation, he said, imagine a room awash in gasoline and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches, the other has 7,000 matches. And each of them is concerned about who's ahead and who's stronger. Obviously, the point here is that people aren't understanding that we're on a knife's edge and that we're on a very dangerous place. A seeming impossible situation and seeming impossible way to, to get out and solve the problems. Um, eventually, uh, President Reagan here on the left, Mikhail Gorbachev from the Soviet Union, um, would get together and, for, and, and begin um, what would eventually become uh, uh, the, the ending of the Cold War. And, uh, and this was a huge thing. It's hard to explain to you all here how monumental this was. Reagan was, we hate the communists. Soviet Union was, we hate the West. And these were folks coming together. The guy in the middle, Pavel, was Gorbachev's translator. And I got to meet him um, uh, several years after this uh, uh, with, in, a, in a meeting about a U.S. Uh, uh, Soviet uh, peace uh, outreach efforts. And I was talking to this guy, Pavel, and it was the, f it was one of the few times in the world I was, and Gabriel can tell you, I, I talk, I'll talk forever. It was one of the few times in the world I couldn't talk to this guy. We were having dinner and I, I was crying. I was losing it. And I was trying to tell him how important this outreach was from the Soviet Union and the notion of coming together and to solve an apparently impossible situation and how it completely changed my worldview this notion of the ending of the Cold War, and we didn't have to conceive of our lives as pitted against um, these, these other human beings.
couple qu- quotes here. I'm probably getting too deep into this, but but uh, Martin Luther King spoke of how um, hatred can lead to impossible um, challenges. Um, Robert uh, Samuelson and other people have now talked about climate change and disasters and things that we're seeing around us as an impossible problem. But throughout our history, throughout our, the, the history of our species, we have lots of examples of people thinking a problem was impossible, but is actually something we can deal with. So here's one from Sir Walter Scott. And it says, to the timid and hesitating, everything is impossible. Why? Because it seems so. So really to solve our, our climate challenge, to deal with these disasters, um, it really takes you guys, you young folks, uh, not thinking that things are impossible and that we can we can solve these problems. Okay, so that's that's a bit of my my prelude. Maybe that was too weird of a prelude or, or too dark of a prelude. But but let's talk about a little bit about what disasters are like now. Starting in 1980, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, which is the entity, the federal entity in our country that deals with one of the largest science entities in our country, it deals with uh, the oceans. It deals with the atmosphere, it, all of our weather satellites, etc. And so these folks uh, have started uh, tracking, amongst other things, massive disasters. So the uh, disasters that cost at least a billion dollars or more. So not just a mild thing, not just a little disaster, but, but big, major impacts. Um, and they can come in a variety of forms. Uh, they can come from uh, hurricanes, they can come from uh, earthquakes, they can come from wildfires, etc. And we've been seeing more and more of these disasters every year. And um, every state has, since 1980, every state has had at least a billion, at least one billion dollar uh, disaster, and many of them have had a lot. So this is what that looks like. This is these large-scale natural disasters. We call them natural disasters, although I would argue that um, natural disaster is, is sort of a strange moniker uh, and that there really, there really is no such thing pretty much anymore as a true natural disaster. We humans have such a large footprint on the earth that even something that is, is purely caused by something that humans didn't do, a volcano going off, because of our development pattern, because of the choices we've made in society, that natural disaster soon evolves into a, a human catastrophe and is made worse by some of our choices. In any event, natural disaster is the term we, we default to using. So this is all that data. This is the data from um, uh, 1980 onwards. And when do we see these disasters? What we see is, so right now we're, we're talking right now in springtime, right? As we go throughout the calendar year, disasters are going to become more and more likely until we get to December. The costs of these disasters, or the number of these billion dollar disasters, and so therefore the total cost has also been going up, and it's been going up dramatically since about 2010. So um, uh, I'm going kind of faster. Is this making sense, everybody? So on the x-axis, we have sort of the time of year. On the y-axis, we have how many billions of dollars um, a disaster or disasters have caused, and the the colored lines in this case are representing different years. That like steep drop off is kind of crazy, like or like spike. Not yeah, off. yeah, yeah, totally right. And so we're seeing this more and more. So so with a lot of our disasters, um, so I don't like the term global warming. I I prefer the term global weirding because that, that that that's a more accurate description. Um, some places in our planet, overall planet is getting warmer, but what's really happening is things are getting noisier. And so just like Fiona said, um, um, one of the things that's happening is we're seeing, you know, things are whatever you want to pick, CO2 in the atmosphere, number of wildfires, whatever. We sort of historically have this kind of, you know, this noise, there's this background level of this thing. And what climate change is doing is making that, that thing, whatever the variable is, start to go whoomp, you know, really big swings and really big arcs. And so this noise where our planet is becoming increasingly noisy in terms of whatever you want to talk about, wildfires, um, um, hurricanes, what have you. And that noise is leading to much uh, greater damage and much increased costs. And so that's what we're seeing here. The, the, these spikes are, are going crazily. Um, the other thing that we're, is this okay? Is this making sense, you guys? Am I going too fast? Is this about Okay. Okay. All right. So um, the other thing you'll hear, which is totally wrong, 
is you'll hear that we're divided, we're a country divided, or people are, are don't know about climate change, people aren't are unsure about natural disasters, that's all baloney. Um, almost everybody believes that climate change is a real thing, they believe the science. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively small number of people that don't think it's a problem. Um, those people tend to be very vocal. Reporters tend to go talk to them and put them in, in news pieces, etc. So it, it, it seems as if there's more people that, that are climate deniers or climate skeptics or whatever the term you want to use is. Uh, that's not the case. And as we have more of these disasters, disasters induce people that might have been on the fence. Well, is this climate change a real thing? Is disaster, are disasters becoming more problematic? These events happen and they convince them. So this is some of the work that uh, my students have been doing. And so uh, we, we do surveys every fall of Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, Los Angeles County, and, and just look at people's attitudes. And so in this case, this is, we asked in the wake of 2017, in the wake of uh, 2018 fires, uh, you know, um, did these fires seriously impact you? And so uh, this is a survey of about uh, 1,300 people. This one in February is a little bit smaller size, only about well, a lot smaller, only about 600 people. But the patterns show up. And what we see is um, about a third of people, again, this is Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA. This is after the Thomas fire. This is after the Woolsey fire, for example. Um, what you see is um, people say that about a third of the people say, yeah, no, we're not impacted by this stuff. But somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of our population were impacted significantly, but maybe just initially. But then what we see pretty clearly is there's about 10 to 20 percent of the population, whenever we ask these questions, six months later, a year later, what have you, are still dealing with the legacy, either because their homes were destroyed, because their businesses were were harmed, um, whatever. And so, so the, the these disasters don't necessarily affect every single person, but when they do hit you, they can be very sticky. And the, the impact on our, on our souls, on our pocketbook, on our mental health, everything can be quite um, significant. Um, and when we ask people, hey, so do you think uh, climate, again, this is from, this survey is from uh, uh, 2018. So this is the wake, this is uh, not quite a year after the Thomas fire hit. And so we asked them, hey, so do you think climate change maybe played a role in? And what you see is almost every, you know, vast majority of folks, almost three quarters of the population say that it was likely or somewhat likely that climate change had some role. Maybe it wasn't the only cause, but it played some role in the devastation um, of the Thomas fire. And, that, and that's borne out by our research and other research of colleagues of mine at other universities and things. So, so again, when we hear people that say climate change isn't a real issue or uh, disasters aren't a real issue, that, that's, that's a very small fraction. It's mostly people in the U.S., uh, a few people in Australia, and a couple other parts of the world, but the vast majority of the planet understands what's going on and, and acknowledges that this is a real serious threat. Um, the other thing to say is that when we talk about these disasters, and, and, and I, I tend to work, uh, the, the disasters I tend to work on are oil spills, wildfires, and um, re recovery from hurricanes in, in Louisiana. Um, but I think sometimes, uh, especially when sort of young folks like you guys that are just sort of getting into this, it can seem massively overwhelming. So not only can it be sort of scary and, and, and fearful and stuff, but it can also um, lead us to believe that we're powerless, that you're powerless. And that's not true at all. And so um, uh, just a little bit about wildfires here. Um, we crafted a lot of our wildfire problem that we are now dealing with. So there's a climate change component to increasing frequencies of wildfires that we're seeing here in California. Um, but there's also a component that we have created, we cr we've crafted, we've bred more conditions for wildfires than there needed to be. And this grew out of some some poor thinking. And so this, this was the birth of the U.S. Forest Service. This was the early 1900s. And the idea was, hey, we want to use all of nature. We want to subjugate nature. We want to, to tell nature what it should be doing. One of the things you want to do is utilize all the resources from nature. And by the way, we like to build houses out of wood and 
and, and timber and things. And so therefore, if a fire comes in and burns up that tree, that's a waste. So we decided that we would create a policy, and I can talk about this for hours if you want, why we did this, but but we basically said, well, our new policy is we're going to stop all these fires because fires are perceived as wasteful. And so we started this approach to fire suppression. And that's, again, another reason why we have so many problems. But this was a completely us humans, particularly American caused problem. And we can get out of this. So in this case, this is a representative shot from the 50s about um, when, it, when this was sort of full bore. And this is like a this looks like an army film, right? There's helicopters and there's dudes, all dudes at the time, because you know women couldn't possibly do this work, and and it's all very sort of paramilitary and and that that there's bulldozers knocking down vegetation, very manly, very macho way to deal deal with stuff, um, and and this was um, in no small part uh, a narrative that was crafted. So sometimes we hear about narratives in terms of in our English classes or whatever, and we think oh that's a way that people build a story or a movie. But absolutely, narratives are incredibly important when we talk about disasters and when we talk about climate change and these things. And so this is the narrative that we built up for ourselves. Um, way too much text here. This is from one of my lectures. So um, suffice it to say that um, we were really interested in stopping fires. And um, and people didn't have much of a, of a, of a way to really get convinced some of the country for, about this. Then came along World War II. Uh, 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 actually, just before World War II, we were in the Great Depression. And one of the things people um, got really angry, one of, the, one of the entities in society that people got really angry uh, at and over were advertisers. And they thought advertisers tricked people into buying stocks. And that's what led to the Great Depression. And, and da, da, da. So, so advertising is evil. So the advertising industry, when World War II ro rolled around, were very, very... Um, uh, they're, they're, they're evil. They're bad, right? They're like, you wouldn't want to associate with them. You wouldn't want your son or daughter dating the, the, the son or daughter of a, of an advertising executive, you know, really bad. Along comes, um, the first, uh, 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 mainland attack in the U S in World War II. So the Japanese sent over, um, a, a little attack sub thing to do psychological warfare. And they bombed Santa Barbara. They bombed the oil fields. So that picture on the left is a, is a picture afterwards where the, they threw a few shells and didn't really cause any problem, but it freaked people out. And one of the things that freaked people out was, um, this was the early days of World War II, um, was uh, the idea that maybe some of those bombs would have gone over and would have caught some of the vegetation in Santa Barbara on fire or, or the Los Padres forest on fire. And oh my God, that sounds horrible. So all of a sudden, uh, the advertising industry saw a way for them to, to redeem themselves. And so this fear of the other, this fear of foreigners, this fear of this invading force was something they could latch onto. And so they decided that uh, fire prevention was a way they could, they could uh, uh, get some hands at this. And so this is a scene from Bambi, right? So, so Bambi, that, like what's up with Bambi? Bambi was a, a film that started that people weren't going to which is kind of weird to think that people would go to a Disney film that they didn't, <laughs> they didn't, people didn't go to, but it was not doing too well. Um, and so the, um, the uh, uh, advertising executives and the, and the people that were worried about forest fires and trying to suppress forest fires um, decided they could latch on to that. And so they used the imagery of Bambi. So for over a year, they licensed the image of Bambi and started putting them on, on posters everywhere. Uh, after, and that helped promote the movie actually. And it led to many more people seeing Bambi and it turned into a huge commercial success for Disney. So that's another interesting side note here. So, um, so we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, they used Bambi for a little while, then they ran out of the license for that. So then we turned to talking about forest fires and defeating forest fires analogous to defeating an enemy. So there's all kinds of racist imagery that's used. There's all kinds of very fearful imagery that are used. And we, we, we sort of knock around for a while and then we hit upon the warm, cuddly, fuzzly, fuzzy bear and Smokey the bear comes along. And then we have Smokey the bear and Smokey the bear starts this whole campaign that convinces everyone from little, little kids to adults that fire is really bad and fire is an enemy. And so because of that, we've really suppressed fire and that's, and Smokey bear is in no small part, one of the reasons why we have so much fuel built up around Ventura County, Los Angeles County, uh, and throughout uh, the U S that is fueling this fire and upon which climate change 
can therefore act and make even more intense and even more crazy. And so that's the situation that we have right now. So here's a little bit of data. Um, and again, you guys interrupt me if I'm, I'm sort of going off on weird tangents here and trying to uh, say something that might be of interest to some of you guys. So you can interrupt me if you guys have any questions. But, but this is what we've now inherited. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at a timeline, a reconstruction of forest fires in the western U.S. On the x-axis, this is, this is different uh, back in the day. So on the left, it's uh, from 1600 up to just a little bit past the year 2000. On the uh, left-hand side, this is the percentage of all the sites in this particular monitoring area uh, that had uh, fires. Okay, and so and so for that, um, uh, we are uh, we we can we can look at the pattern through time. So what do we see? First, it's noisy, right? So as I, I mentioned one of the aspects about climate change is that the world is getting a, a lot more noisier. In the case, of the case of fuel for wildfires, we've actually done the reverse. We've actually dampened the variation. So right here, we can see that um, you know one year there might not be many big fires, and the next year might not be a lot of big fires. And all of a sudden, boom, it explodes, and there's a huge, you know, relatively large fire. And then, and then it goes down for a while. What was going on? What happened? What, that, that's the natural thing. So the 1600 to about um, late 1800s, that was the natural pattern. That's what our plants and animals have adapted to, have evolved under that regime. And this is what the um, Native American cultures that were here, what they evolved uh, and, and, and dealt with, etc. cetera. Um, and, so, and so that was the background. So when John Muir got on the back of a horse and rode into Yosemite Valley, he rode like, you know, tucker, 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 or whatever the sound is it makes when you ride a horse. Um, and he, he rode into Yosemite Valley. No problem. He didn't duck. He didn't, he didn't crouch down. He didn't do anything like that. Now, if you and I tried to ride into Yosemite Valley on a horse, we couldn't even do it, right? It's all full of undergrowth. It's full of all this uh, small trees, small shrubs, etc. And if somehow we were able to be on a horse, we would be, we'd be ducking, right? There's all these low branches that we'd be whacking our heads. In the era from 1600 to 1900, all that would have been cleared out by small fires, more common fires, but the fires didn't kill the forest, didn't, didn't kill all the trees. I mean, occasionally one or two here, but, but it just cleared out the lower vegetation. The large trees could take fire. How do we have this data in front of us? We have this data from taking essentially a big metal straw, jamming it into the side of a tree, pulling it out and counting the rings and measuring how old the tree is and looking at the fire scars, looking at the, the, the charcoal marks, the burn marks uh, uh, that were left. And so that's how we know there was a fire there. So, so this notion of fire as, as a, a part of this ecosystem and a part of this part of the world is very old and is very real. And we've been messing with the system. So we're messing with the, our climate system. We've been messing with our, our vegetative communities for some time. And so the answer is partly to deal with wildfire is to reintroduce some of this fire, to put some fire back in to the, um, to the environment and deal with it. And, and this will help lower the fuel. So it's kind of weird. So the way we deal with fire is to have more fire. Yes, but we want to have it... Um, uh, uh, controlled. We don't want to have these massively raging fires like the Thomas fire or the Woolsey fire. Um, curiosity. Yeah, sorry. please go. Um, so like we last year, I mean, Dave and I were both in the same actually environmental class held by this faculty. Um, and like they talked about controlled burns, which mm -hmm. totally makes sense with all this. But with, is there another example kind of similar to like um, wildfires and like us kind of messing with it that like we can specifically pay I'm just like trying to think of other like if it like if it's happening with wildfires and it's probably like due to like human ignorance yeah it's happening to a lot of other problems yeah totally you name it and, it and it and it works that way so for example um uh invasive species we've introduced all kinds of invasive species we thought would be beneficial we thought would help people or, or help livestock or something which have now gotten totally out of control um uh, let's see, uh, we could talk about drought is the same kind of thing about how we've, we've sucked water. We've completely changed how water flows through terrestrial ecosystems. In fact, the most threatened ecosystem, if we had a, you know, just sort of on, on an ecosystem per ecosystem basis, we hear a lot about the rainforest. We hear a lot about 
coral reefs, and, and those are real problems, but by far the most threatened ecosystems on the planet are our rivers, our, our freshwater ecosystems. And that's because we've sucked out um, and, and changed the way water flows in these systems. So in some cases, we've sucked the water out and used them to irrigate our, our front yards or our, make our toilets flush or something. In other cases, um, we've put water in at different times. So because we've dammed these rivers and we now dictate how the water flows and the time of year that they flow, very different systems. So on the Colorado, so Gabriel and I, uh, we went down uh, the Green River and then onto the Colorado River a couple summers ago. We were canoeing, and uh, Gabriel, was that water warm or cold? Uh, it was. From what I remember, it was super cold. <laughs> super cold, right? Now, if, if if one of the reasons it's super cold is because we have all these dams on the Colorado and these, these other systems. And we release water from the bottom of these giant lakes that we've created. Historically, there weren't these giant lakes and the water was relatively warm. So, so we've, we've changed the temperature of water. We've changed the volume of water. We've changed the rate at which water flows down. So fire is not the only thing that we've manipulated. We've manipulated many of, uh, the aspects of our planet. Um, Humans now fix more nitrogen than all the, the bacteria, all the microbes on the planet. Um, we, uh, we dictate where sand goes now around the planet. So, so all these different parameters we could pick, but I would say that there's lots of things. Um, does that, Fiona, does that make sense? Yes, that's okay. actually, it, it led me to think like, you know, as you were talking about how it's like changed different like pathways, you know, like with the cold water, it probably has definitely changed the ecosystem there, like the fish and the vegetation, and like, of course, the fires and all the wildlife there. So then what would you recommend being the solution? Like, I mean, with the fires, sure. of course, control the burns would like return it back to what it used to be. Let's try. Um, so like, would you say, but things have already started like adapting to it very slowly. So mm -hmm. would it be more traumatic for them? to like immediately reverse back to their original pattern, like trying to imitate or yeah. to go a different way. So I, so I, uh, I, I've, I've been stuck at home like everybody and, and, um, I've been trying to exercise more cause I'm an old fat bald dude. Right. And so I've been trying to exercise more and I've actually lost about 50 pounds since the, since the start of the pandemic. Right. Um, I didn't lose 50 pounds in the first week. Right. I, it, it's, you know, over a year now I've been trying to do this. And so you don't get fat overnight. I didn't get fat overnight, right? It took me a long time to get fat. Um, and so recovering from that takes a long time. And I think um, with all these problems, right, it, it took us a long time to get here, um, or at least many of them took a long time for us to get here. And so that means that our recovery from them is also going to take some time. And that's a huge, that's a really, really important point. I can't tell you how many politicians I meet with or how many, uh, you know, managers or whatever. And especially in the wake of a disaster, especially in the wake of an oil spill or, or a wildfire. And they're like, what do we do? We need to solve it. And it's like, oh, totally great. Yeah. Let's work on solving it. And they're like, e -e -e -e. it's like, can you tell me the thing right now that like, like the magic bullet. And oftentimes there is no magic bullet. Oftentimes, or, or no silver bullet, as people sometimes call it. It, it, the analogy people use is silver buckshot. So it's not a, a single bullet that's magically going to kill the werewolf and save the world. It's rather a shotgun that throws out a bunch of little teeny tiny things. And it's, it's that constellation of, of many, many different approaches, many different um, ideas that really will get us to a better place. And so, so, uh, and, but that will take some time. So for example, this year, um, this last year, unprecedented. So uh, million, So I, I probably should have put this graph in. I didn't. But, but um, if we look at the amount or the amount of acreage that is burned in wildfires in California over the last, you know, say 100 years, it's been going up. And then again, really since 2000 and 2010, the, the rate's been, you know, going up just similar to that, um, that graph I showed you before. But all of a sudden we hit 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 and it, it's, it's never been this high. So we burned almost 2 million acres of land in California. That's crazy. But to answer Fiona's question, 
to to burn the amount of uh, wildlands that we think we need to do to reduce this um, to reduce this fuel load, we probably need to be burning about four million acres. So as crazy as this unprecedented year of burns was, we probably need to, on the order of at least double that, and do that for about 15, 20 years to really deal with this fuel load um, that, that is, is both created by our processes and then drought and, and climate change has been making it worse. But, but to sort of get to a more stable state in terms of the fuel load. And so, you know, telling people to, that we need to burn is very hard. I can tell you some stories about that. Um, but maybe you can convince them like, okay, we're going to do a burn this time, right? Is that a cool? And they're like, well, okay. But for me to say, we're going to burn and then we need to burn um, and then we need to burn and then we need to burn and then we need to burn. Like they're like, whoa, 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 dude. Like, what are you talking about? So when I first went up to, so before my wife and I and Gabriel, before we moved down here, um, uh, we were at Stanford University for several years. And so when I went up there, I was working on restoring coastal ecosystems. And uh, I, I'm a marine biologist by training, so it's very strange that a marine biologist was starting fires and things. Uh, uh, anyway, um, so when I went up there, I, I decided, you know, I, wanna, I wanted to use fire, and that was a tool to help restore some of our invaded grasslands and things. But I, I had not been to a burn, so I, I you know, got some training, and I tried to go to a controlled burn. I went to 19, or, or, or tried to go to 19 controlled burns before I got to my first controlled burn. Why? All, all, uh, 19, all 18 of those were called off at the last minute. So, so this was, we had fire trucks, we had the, the fire professionals, we, we mapped out where we were gonna go, we told everybody about it, it was all prepared, we're getting ready, and then, but then the, usually within 24 hours, and sometimes within a couple hours of, of, of somebody taking the lit flare and touching the grass to start the control burn, called off. Why called off? Usually because of worries about asthma. And usually because all of a sudden that day, the weather was going to be like stagnant, no winds. And people like in San Jose or wherever, they said, oh no, man, we got to be real. We got to be worried about these people with, with, with breathing problems. So you can't do that burn. And by, by pausing the burn, that usually killed it. And we usually had to start the process. It wasn't like pause today, do it tomorrow, because we have to have fire crews and things. And so, you know, they're normally doing other stuff. So we schedule them for Monday afternoon. They can't necessarily easily come on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. And so, so the notion was, oh, we don't want to cause more problems to deal with these. And, and I don't want to cause people to have breathing problems, a problem. But if we think about the Thomas fire or the Woolsey fire, right? We had people wearing respirators for over a month, right? In the, because of those fires. So, so I don't want to cause more problem for people, but, but we cannot, there have to be some eggs that break here, right? And so. Wouldn't it be like, out of, sorry, out of curiosity, because um, with the fires that happened that weren't controlled, um, like they were very sporadic and they caused a lot of damage to people because people didn't know. So with the controlled burns, wouldn't it be more efficient to like let people with you know asthma and like breathing problems know beforehand like almost like a mandate or something like a an app that you know a county could use to like know when to stay home when to wear a mask i feel like that'd be a lot more efficient than calling out off totally so you'd actually get it done totally yeah so you should make that app you know, that'd be great mm -hmm. I, so so I, so this these are the kind of solutions we need so when i'm talking i'm, I'm very serious i'm not I'm not blowing smoke up your guys' butt or trying to tell you great things. You guys really are the ones that have to get us out of this problem, right? And so that's the way you need to think. So when we have these problems, when we talk about fire, uh, hurricanes, that's Fiona's response is the right response. Like, oh my God, there's a problem? Let's deal with it, right? Or there's some law that's messed up? Okay, cool, let's deal with it. And the problem is uh, while we're doing that, um, there's still enough of the small fraction of deniers and people that aren't interested in solving real problems, there's a bunch of, there's enough people in power that delay stuff, right? And so there's, there's, there's a cottage industry built up in, in delaying things and making us hate each other and making us think the others are stupid, but that's the right attitude. The right attitude is, oh, problem, let's solve it, right? When we went to the moon, it was like, hey, let's go to the moon. And like, 
How the hell do you do that? Don't know. Let's figure it out, right? And we we made errors, right? We we killed some people. We wasted money. We went down wrong paths, but we eventually got to the moon, right? And and that's how we have to think about this problem. We can totally get ourselves out of it, but it does require new thinking. It does require um, um, seeing a problem and saying we're going to tackle it. Unfortunately, there's there's enough people here that are just trying to trip you, you know, as you're walking through the door, trying to stick their foot out and like, oh, well, yeah, you know, it's expensive, you know, screw those people, right? They are completely wrong. It is expensive to do these control burns. If Fiona wants to make a, an app, that's going to be, that's going to be expensive, but it's going to be cheaper than a bunch of folks having a respiratory attack during a, during a, um, um, you know, a, a fire or a control burn or a wildfire. Right. So so all these things, um, another key thing that you guys need to think about as you're as you're getting older and as you're thinking about these issues is um, one of the red herrings, one of the, the logical fallacies that people will throw out is they'll say, oh, it's expensive or it's going to change. Right. And um, the, you have to think about uh, so-called business as usual. So, yes, it might be expensive. Yes, it might suck to change how we water our lawns or, or whatever. But what's the alternative to keep doing what we're doing? And what's the cost of that? And that is usually what, what these, you know, head in the sand ostriches, people that deny reality, people that don't look at, at the real thing. So they, they, they don't want you to talk about that. Right. And so that's when I talk about don't being a, don't be a wimp. Right. Don't, right. don't listen to those silly jerks. Right. Um, um, we need to be stronger for ourselves and for them and for them. And so, you know, I can't, a, a, a story I tell, I usually have a picture about this, but I, but I don't, um, I didn't put it in this talk, but so I have, a, there's a, um, uh, some neighbors down the street from us. I'll just say it this way. And uh, so I love our street. So we, we have a great street where we live. We have conservative folks. We have liberal folks. We have old people, young people. Uh, there's some cops here. There's some firefighters here. There's somebody that played for the Iranian national soccer team. There's all, all, the various mix of people, which I love. I don't like being in a place where everybody thinks the same or looks the same or says the same thing. So anyway, so we moved here, and I have a, I had a, I still have a Prius that Gabriel knows. He says it smells funny, but you know that's fine. It's an old car. Anyway, so um, so a uh, couple of these guys down the street. Um, were uh, conservative folks. And when I moved in, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, they're liberal, right? I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Like, well, you're like a scientist, dude, right? And so uh, good folks, I like them, but they would always, um, they would always, uh, you know, elbow me like, hey, dude, oh, the world's ending again, right? You know? Um, and so uh, uh, one day I'm, I'm coming up the street and one of our neighbors is down there and he has a, he had a, a Older gentleman, lived by himself, big, huge Escalade, massive SUV. He didn't, wasn't driving kids to school. He wasn't towing a boat. He just had a big old boat of a car, right? And, uh, and he'd always be like, oh, how's your, how's your putt-putt doing, you know? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Um, and so one day, he, uh, he walked, uh, summertime, I'm, we live on a hill, so I'm driving up the street, and he waves to me, and so I... I um, uh, go over and he goes, Hey, and he, and I roll down the window and he puts his hands on the window of my Prius and he looks at it and he goes, how many miles per gallon you get in here? Right. And I almost said, Oh yeah. Like you care how many miles per gallon I'm ready for some joke. Right. Gabriel, this was Tom. If you're wondering who I'm talking about. And so, so Tom said, he says, um, but he wasn't joking. And he's like, how many miles per gallon? I said, well, when I we were in the Bay Area, I was getting about 49 miles per gallon. But now because I go up and down the the, the grade and, and stuff, don't quite get as good. So I get like 45, 46 miles per gallon. And he went, jeez, really? I was like, yeah. I said, how many, what do you get in that thing? He's like, like eight or nine, right, miles per gallon in his car. And, he, and then I was waiting for the joke, like uh, blah, 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 blah. And he says, um, Really? So then he starts asking me other questions about fuel efficiency. And I'm like, uh, so I give him an answer. And he asked me another question. And now we're in the middle of the street, right? On our hot summer day. And I said, why are you asking me these questions? And he said, well, my, my you know, SUV is getting old. I'm thinking about uh, getting another car. And I said, okay. And he said, so I'm thinking about getting a hybrid. And, you know, 
thank God I didn't have a big burrito or something because I probably would have messed my pants, right? I was like, what? You're thinking about getting a... And so I wanted to say, what? You are thinking about getting a... Like, what, dude? You know? But I bit my tongue. And instead I said, huh, that's a great idea. And I said, hey, anytime you want to borrow this car, take it for a test drive, you... Anytime you want, you 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 do it. And he goes, wow, okay, I think... I think I will. And like, how much was it again? And so, I, and so, so the other thing that when we, when we have these interactions with people, right, um, we have to remember these are our brothers and sisters, right? These are our other, these are our fellow travelers on this journey we're on. And even though people can be really uh, set in their ways, disasters and, and, and crises have a way of opening people's eyes. And so that's one of the reasons why they're they're a really important aspect of our future and an important, they, they provide an opportunity, right? And so, so w- when, when those moments happen, you usually can't prepare for them. It's, it's the, the crazy neighbor goes, can I drive your car? And it's so easy, especially when we've been struggling in these situations without money, without resources, we've been losing the political battle to change something. It's very, very tempting to say, I told you so, you know, bleepity bleep. You know, but we can't, we can't, you have to be the bigger person. You have to say, oh yeah, well, I'm glad you finally realized that coal is not a sustainable product. And let's talk about, I I love the fact that you came up with the idea of windmills. That's such an original idea. Let's talk about it, right? Is the goal showing that we were right? Is the goal gloating? Or is the goal less wildfire? Is the goal uh, more sustain, more healthy children? Is the goal more more um, you know racial justice? Right, that's the goal. And and when we are in these battles and in these fights and in the trenches for so long, it can be sometimes hard to see that. But take a breath. You know, you can go yell when you get home, but you take a breath and very nicely say, that's a great idea. Compliment the people. That was, wow, I can't believe you came up with that on your own. That's a, that's a brilliant insight. And because the goal is to solve these problems, right? The, 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 the goals are to get us out of these problems we find ourselves in. I don't care who gets credit. I don't care, uh, you know, what happens as long as we are moving in the right direction and hopefully moving in the right direction um, um, quickly. So, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I could talk about this for hours. I'm, I'm probably getting late. I'll just, I'll finish with a, a slide or two um, here. But, but um, uh, just to say that um, you all have to be more sophisticated than, than Joe Blow, than random person, right? You are the educated one. Remember, sometimes, you know, when we're young or we're not an expert in wildfire and let's talk about wildfire, somebody kind of think, well, I don't know what do you think? You are more educated than virtually the entire human population. The vast majority of our species for the vast majority of our history, uh, tracking that that uh, um, buffalo, right? Trying to kill that saber-toothed tiger, trying to uh, get enough water to irrigate our crops, right? That That's how most of our species spends most of their lives today and throughout history. You are the anointed few. You are the incredibly uh, rare part of our society, of our species, that has the luxury to learn. You all have been spending the last several years at Oaks. You uh, have been spending the years before that learning. That's an incredible opportunity. I would argue you have a responsibility to the rest of our species. And so when these problems come up, you need to be the one that voices your opinion. You need to to speak up. And so one of the things that you need to do is to educate yourselves on some of the specifics. So in this case, this is a classic example, kind of a little bit what Fiona was asking about earlier. But um, so I mentioned that that fire, that big fires are, we've suppressed fire. And so we have all these, these, this fuel is built up. And so we're having these larger fires. And so the problem is that we haven't had as many starts to fires. That's not always the case. Right here in the Santa Monica Mountains, so that's what we're looking at. So just to, just to make sure we're talk, we're all on the same page. Here's Los Angeles over here. Here's Point Doom. Here's Malibu Lagoon. So Oaks is over over here. Um, uh, so this is the Santa Monica. The black outline thing here is the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. And so uh, what we're seeing here is fire return rates. What is a fire return rate? 
So the bushes catch fire, and then how long a period till they burn next, right? So that, that, that's, that's the return rate of fire. And uh, for this area, um, we think that the historic, and by looking at the data, it, it seems to be the historic return rate of fire on the order of about 20 years. So if we, had, if we pick some random spot on, um, uh, 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 in the Santa Monica Mountains, we would expect every 20-ish years or so, there would be a fire there. But have a look at this. Some of these areas, uh, and so so this is a heat map. So the hotter the the, the hotter the colors, uh, the the larger uh, or the, in this case the shorter the return interval. And so in some of these places, like down here around these really expensive mansions here on the coast, or, or up over here, it, we're talking more like seven years, seven eight years of fire return rates. So in some places where we have a lot of human activity on the edge of the so-called wildlands urban interface, we've actually had more fire. So here, the problem isn't too fire in too, freak, in too infrequently, it's that we're starting fires too frequently. So these are kids going out, uh, drinking at night and starting a fire, legal campfire. These are, these are cars pulling off the side of the road and, and, and accidentally you know, setting a spark and you know, that kind of stuff. And so, so it's so you'll hear these red herrings where people say, "Oh yeah, well, these scientists said that we need to have more fires, but we have so many fires in here, right?" So, so um, we have to be sophisticated when we talk about these things and understand that whatever we're talking about—drought, wildfires, whatever—there um, is going to be variation. Not only is climate change making things more variable and more noisy, but uh, our our decisions also make a complex landscape. And how we deal with that is, is a non-trivial thing. I'm probably out of time. Do I want to say anything? Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just finish with maybe one, one or two more slides to say that um, examples of global weirding, I call this stuff global weirding, um, is, is uh, we, are, we are the epicenter. Ventura County, as crazy as it sounds, I didn't realize this until we moved here, but Ventura County in particular, Southern Santa Barbara and Northern Ventura County, is really the poster child for dealing with climate change. So Thomas Fire and things like that, but also some of the changing weird climate systems we're getting. So, um, so we are windier and windier. And, uh, and you guys all know the Santa Ana's, right? They're getting more Santa Ana-y. So the period of Santa Ana winds are expanding and we are at the epicenter. So, th so this is, again, another heat map, how intense the, the winds blow. And so you can see here the, these, these more concerted colors are um, more intense winds. And so right here, uh, you know, this corridor, the Santa Clara River Valley. So here from like sort of northern L.A. County, uh, Ventura County, the winds are just cranking through. We get atmospheric rivers tagging our place also, atmospheric rivers used to be called Pineapple Express, used, used to be called um, other terms, but now we recognize them as so-called atmospheric rivers, which are uh, which come in our winter time and just dump, right? So we're getting, so the winds are getting more intense, but also more variable from day to day. The rains are obviously more variable too, and all these things are coming together to create a crazy system. So Ventura County is really the poster child. One of the reasons the Thomas Fire happened here winds, right? The Thomas Fire wouldn't have been anywhere near as devastating, wouldn't have started, in fact, if, if we didn't have a really windy day. And, and this, is, this is increasingly common. So I, I could talk for hours and hours more about this stuff, but, but maybe I'll just pause there. Um, and, and that was a bit of a rambling talk. I don't know if that was very helpful to you guys, but, um, but I would just say uh, uh, these things can seem overwhelming. These things can seem scary, but they don't have to be. And just like the moon race, World War II, all these challenges, let's, okay, this sucks, right? This is a bad thing. Let's solve it. That's the approach we should bring to this. Not, not fear, not maybe a little bit of frustration that, that you guys have to clean up our mess, but the fact remains, let's solve it, right? And in doing this, huge benefits for our society, huge benefits for a more equitable culture, huge benefits for business, right? All these things we're talking about, dealing with wild, farming with fire, you know, burning a lot every time, there's an industry there, right? Uh, wind 
turbines, there's an industry there, right? So all these things can come along with a lot of great things. We just have to get out of the old mindsets of, of thinking about uh, things in, in unproductive ways. And so with that, maybe I'll, I'll uh, pause and ask if you guys have any, uh, any questions. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. That was a, a very, very great PowerPoint and like presentation. It was um, like around different topics, but it was really enjoyable. And cool. Like motivating. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. That's great. I have two questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, first of all, who played on an Iranian soccer team on the street? Uh, so the people that are neighbors to the Sobariskis. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the other thing was, what was the, um, uh, the, I forget exactly what it was, but the event you mentioned at, in Santa Barbara uh, during the early World War II. Oh. When was that in relation to like Pearl Harbor and all that? Really? Oh, so that, that, that was in the months after Pearl Harbor. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was, so that was, uh, yeah, yeah, so um, it's a really interesting story, um, but, but that is really um, what, uh, so, so the the Japanese internment, the 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 executive order was already signed for that. that that's a whole other story of of fear and and racism. And you know, we didn't really in, intern every single German on the on the East Coast, right? But anyway, um, but but so that was already started, or the um, the executive order had been signed, but it hadn't been inactivated. And then when this happened, and it was a bombing, and and all these wild rumors got going, uh, including that, oh, they, they must have had help, right? They must have had spies on shore to figure out where this oil depot was over up at Elwood. So this is basically where the um, the butterfly sanctuary is now in, in that part of, of Santa Barbara, Goleta area. Anyway, um, and so so this radically helped, um, again, it didn't start, but it really threw, threw gasoline on the... Um, the idea for Japanese internment, in, internment, and so so this was like you know as you saw I had a newspaper that was front page news. It was mainland bombing of the U.S. Even though virtually nothing was damaged, and they were able to clean it up in a day or or two, right? They didn't they didn't uh, blow up any. You know the idea was blow up a bunch of oil tanks. And the bombs didn't really do what they wanted them to do. Um, uh, so uh, so yeah, but it was cool. I think I have uh, an inspector downstairs that I should probably go I talk to. So um, anyway, but if there's any last burning questions, I can answer them. Otherwise, you guys can can ask Gabriel to ask me, and I, I can I can answer them later if that's cool. Awesome, that sounds great. And yeah, maybe because I just had a few questions about like um, like you said, you know, with the app and like policymakers and seeing like maybe giving the club and like club members an opportunity to help out and like get more involved in the community um that'd be great to talk to you about tonight but i know that you have an inspector downstairs and we need to get this off pretty soon but um i can ask you about that too. cool perfect awesome well thanks you guys and happy to always come back and talk about this more or other things you guys just let me know awesome thank you so much no no worries talk to you guys soon